You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is December 17, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, food allergy and oral allergy syndrome. Our presenter is Dr. Carmen Storm. She's a pediatric resident at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. got several different presentations today, and we're going to start out with an oral presentation about food allergy and oral allergy syndrome from uh, Dr. Carmen Storm. Dr. Storm has been spending some time with us uh, this month in the allergy, uh, on, on an allergy rotation, and she's agreed to speak with us today about food allergies. So uh, welcome to Conferences Online Allergy. Thank Dr. you. Storm. So I wanted to do a topic that I felt was pretty pertinent to primary care, which I feel like this is. Um, this might be a little bit elementary for you guys, but I think um, it's important stuff. You just have to activate the screen. And there you go. Okay. So, the, so by definition, food allergy is just an abnormal immune response to usually a protein in a certain food. I think it's also important to remember that a lot of times it's these additives that can actually cause the, um, the allergy. Um, it can be IgE-mediated, which I think is what we typically think about, cell-mediated or mixed. Um, food allergies are the most common cause of generalized anaphylaxis that's seen in the emergency room. So again, important. So allergies as a whole are really common, but food allergies are rare. It's estimated to be about 1 to 2 percent of the general population, a little bit higher in kids, 4 percent, but we know that they can outgrow them. Food allergies can be familial, which I actually didn't realize, but if you have two parents that have an allergy to a food, you have a 75 percent chance of having that. One parent, it's like 30 to 40 percent, and then no parents, then it's obviously the same as the general population. So these eight foods, peanuts, tree nuts, soy, shellfish, cow's milk, wheat, and eggs, cause 85 percent of all food allergies. So these are the, the important ones. I thought it was also important to know that peanuts and tree nuts cause 85 percent of um, fatal anaphylactic um, responses. Again, also important to remember here that a lot of those ad additives and dyes and that kind of thing um, are responsible too for the allergies. So how do you make the diagnosis? So I think most importantly it's the temporal association. I eat a peanut, I can't breathe. You know, the timing is important um, when you think about that association. The reproducibility of symptoms, obviously, well, I've ate peanuts three times, and this has happened three times. It's the classic clinical features, which we'll talk about. Um, you could confirm with skin prick testing, which has about a 95% negative predictive value, so it's good to rule out. Or you can use the blood levels, but they have a high false positive rate, so just things to remember. If the history is inconsistent, um, the gold standard would be double-blind placebo controlled trials, but I know a lot of times that's difficult to do. So the clinical presentation, again, it's usually quick, but it can be up to about two hours to initially present. You can think about organ systems and in, in the different reactions you'll have. The skin reaction is probably most common with the urticaria, itching, that kind of thing. Oral reaction can be swelling or itching um, of basically any part of the face. Um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain can be the GI component. And then, of course, the scary stuff that we think about, the wheezing and the trouble breathing with the respiratory system. I thought it was important to talk about anaphylaxis here because I think that's what we're all scared of. Um, so I basically just talked about, uh, did the definition. So it's sudden onset, it's immediate, and it's important to remember it's potentially fatal. So by definition, again, it's acute onset. It involves usually skin and mucosal tissue and then one of the following, so either respiratory compromise or hypotension with end organ damage. You also need two or more of the following that occur rapidly after exposure to the allergen. allergen. So again, it's involvement of the skin, mucosal surface, respiratory issues, reduced blood pressure, or the GI symptoms. And then um, it can simply be reduced blood pressure after exposure to a known allergy that the patient has. Um, again, can be immunologic 
um, which is the IgE-mediated things that we're talking about, non-immunologic, which I think the biggest one people think about is contrast dye, um, which is more of the mast cell um, and lymphocyte response, and then idiopathic. Um, this is something I actually didn't know that tryptase level can be helpful in establishing the diagnosis of true anaphylaxis. As soon as you can get it, the better, but within six hours for sure. So fatality. So there are different risk factors that increase the risk of fatality. I think they're kind of self-explanatory, but a patient who has concomitant asthma, um, teenager or young adult, um, people who are not aware of their symptoms or minimize their symptoms, obviously people who delay the use of their epi, um, those are the people who are more likely to die. Um, death is usually from asphyxiation from the laryngeal or oropharyngeal swelling from the the shock itself or from cardiac or respiratory arrest. So oral, oral allergy syndrome, another thing that was new to me this month. So this is caused by cross-reactivity that can occur with proteins in foods that are similar to a protein in a pollen that you might be allergic to. So this is usually just kind of that itching or weird sensation of the face, lips, tongue, or oral cavity. There is usually no wheezing or respiratory issues involved at all. Um, if the history is consistent and that's kind of what you think it is, an in-office oral challenge can help because then you can help reassure the patient that they're not actually allergic and nothing bad will happen, it's just uncomfortable, um, which I actually got to do in clinic with peanut butter this month, which was interesting because it happened pretty fast. So treatment. The big thing is avoidance. Um, it's important to remember that sometimes you'll have to go as far as like reading food labels. You need to alert you know, your friends, your family, people you're with. Um, restaurant staff when you go out to eat, because some people can be as allergic as like walking by a kitchen that has, you know, peanuts in it or whatever, and they can start to have a reaction. You can use H1 antagonists for mild um, response, but then it's always um, intramuscular epi for severe responses. So I think one of the big thing, big thing that people think about is are these reactions lifelong? So the studies would suggest that egg and cow's milk allergies most people outgrow. I think it's like greater than 90% of people outgrow. But peanuts, tree nuts, and shellfish um, in general seem to be lifelong allergies. Prevention. So I know that for us general pediatricians this comes up a lot. So the AAP really only makes one recommendation and that's to breastfeed for four to six months in kids who have a strong atopic family history. I know it used to be, I think when I was an intern the AAP was saying delay introduction of high allergen foods until two years, but that's no longer the case. I think there's no good data to say that delaying introductions um, to different solids helps with the lessening the allergic response. That's all I got. Very good. Questions? I have a question for you. Yeah. So you said 85% of fatal um, <coughs> food allergic reactions are to peanuts or tree nuts. Why do you think that is? Let me rephrase. Do you okay. think that um, peanuts and tree nuts, reaction to peanuts and tree nuts is a more severe reaction than peanuts, than a reaction to, say, egg or milk? I think it's probably just more common. So probably, uh, yes, getting there. So um, I think there is a reason that the prevalence across the whole population would be higher for peanut and tree nuts than it would be for, say, egg and milk. So, it, so remember, incidence would be a new, a new diagnosis of prevalences all the time. So some people are going to be entering to make a prevalence case, and some people are going to be leaving. So who, who are the people who tend to leave food allergic reactions behind at the age? Kids. So kids that are allergic to the, oh, I get what you're saying, the eggs and the cow's milk. So okay. eggs and milk, so then when yeah. you get to be a teenager and very non-compliant, right. you are most likely it's still allergic to yeah. Not completely. Yeah. There's definitely still egg and milk hanging around, but most of the time, peanut doesn't go away, whereas most of the time, egg and milk goes away. Okay. And I guess. the most common time you're going to die from food allergy is in your teenage years when, when you, you don't, don't have it at the end. Right. 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 Partake in risky behavior. Right. So it's not that peanut or tree nut is more allergenic. Got it. It's something else that's just. No, that makes sense. There that's a good point. Years. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Great. Thank yeah. you. I think it's interesting, too. Like, we get lots of. 
families, that, not lots, but definitely a handful of families that come in or adults that say, oh, I'm allergic if I just walk by a certain area, or oh, if I get on my skin, I'm going to have an anaphylactic reaction. And mm -hmm. If there's a, you know, all of them within 100 miles, right. that's a problem. So Dr. Port and I actually started doing these proximity challenges um, in our clinic, and I did one with a patient where the mom was very nervous that the child had allergies and couldn't even be in the same room with mm -hmm. the food, and we actually put the different foods on the child's skin to prove to her that he wouldn't react. So he has to physically, he has to ingest um, the protein for it to cause a reaction. So I think it's something that I don't know if it's going to be something that we do more often, but it definitely was reassuring for the mom Absolutely. to know that, you know, the child could be around those foods. And, yeah. You know, obviously if he got on the skin and then he ingested it, it would be different, but yeah. they're not going to have an anaphylactic reaction by just being in proximity. Yeah. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time.